I want to read you a quote this morning that was said by a person that's in our government. I want you to guess who said it. You ready? It was said on, uh, well, I won't tell you the dates yet. That'll give it away. How about this? Those who have served through the ages have drawn inspiration from the book of Isaiah when the Lord says, Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? And the American military has been answering for a long time. Here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, send me. So who do you think this was that made this comment? It was made by none other than President Joe Biden on August 27th, 2021. Might surprise you, but he said it. This morning, I want to spend a little time as we're on the the cusp of Independence Day. July the 4th is around the corner. I want us to take a a minute and talk a little bit about America. Is that okay? America. You know, in our society, there's a lot of places where God is mentioned. You know that? Isn't that true? And our pledge, that we are what? One nation under God, indivisible. Liberty and justice for all. What does it say on our money? In God we trust. When people are sworn in, when, they, when, when they're sworn into office, what do they do? They place their hand on what? The Bible. Without fail. Here's a question for you this morning. Here's one, here's one we're going we're gonna to attempt to answer just, just a little bit. Is, American, is America a Christian nation? Is America a Christian nation? Has America ever been a Christian nation? Should it be a Christian nation? No, there was a time where people used to think that just because they were American, they were Christian. Right? I'm I'm an American, so I'm a Christian. It goes without saying that I'm a Christian. Well, that's changed, hasn't it? So I want to go back in history a little bit and look at the founders of our country, of our great nation. Who created America? Many historians agree that George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Alexander Hamilton were America's founding fathers. You guys have heard the name of most of those, right? Most of us know those names. Now, there is disagreement on who else should be included in that list or in that group. Some would include the signers of the Declaration of Independence the U.S. Constitution, and some of the early presidents. But these are the guys that most of us think of when we think about the founders of America. And we don't know everything about everyone's faith, but we do know that the faith of the main founding fathers is pretty complicated. These guys, Washington, Franklin, Hamilton, Jefferson, Adams, they were certainly religious men. And they seem to have a Christian worldview to an extent. But to label them as Christians, that's that's, that's tough to to answer. I guess it depends on how you define Christian, right? While there are some founding fathers that would align with our more mainline Protestant, uh, you could even say evangelical type Christian beliefs, and most, most of these guys believed in a God. But they all had their own individual ideals and opinions on who he was. You can look that up. And based off of my research, I don't see our founders fitting neatly into a certain category when it comes to their belief systems. They all had their own ideals and beliefs. They would all agree, though, that living a a good and moral life was the best service that anyone could give to God. They would agree with that. They wanted a moral society. And they believed that in order for that to happen, religion had to be a key factor. That a society without religion would be an immoral society. And most of us today that that call ourselves Christians would probably agree with that statement. But here's a key distinction. The founders believed that virtually all religions, not just Christianity, if allowed to exist and practice without state influence or intervention, were basically good. All of them were good and would bring about a moral society. So were the founders Christians? 
Did they intend to create a Christian nation? I'm not sure that we can honestly and conclusively answer that one. One thing we know for sure is this. While they all had a high level of respect for Jesus and his teachings, many of them did not believe in Jesus exclusively as Lord and Savior. And their thoughts about who he was were all over the map. They also had differing views and thoughts on Scripture. See, here at Church in the Country, we believe that the Bible is totally true, that it has no error in it, that it was inspired by God and is the ultimate authority on all things. But Thomas Jefferson, believe it or not, didn't see it that way. Thomas Jefferson actually edited and created it, edited and created his own Bible, believe it or not, where he literally took a razor and cut out parts of the Bible that he thought were unbelievable. Pretty much all the miracles of Jesus he cut out. He did away with those. He, he did away with the virgin birth. Any suggestion that Jesus was God was removed, and of course the, the miracle of the resurrection is gone. Thomas Jefferson thought of Jesus as a great philosopher, worth reading, worth maybe even modeling his lifestyle in a lot of respects, but certainly not divine and certainly not Lord. You know, this morning it's mostly patriotic Americans and, and, and American-loving people sitting in this room, Christian people in this room today. This may be an inconvenient truth for us. I'd personally prefer it if all of these famous American founders, these great fathers of our nation, believed exactly the way that I do, but they did not. See, as people who believe in truth, who believe in absolute truth, we must be honest about our history. America was not founded by exclusively or even a majority of Christian founding fathers. I'd say they were Christian-ish. Okay? Christian-ish. Now, before you start to throw vegetables and tomatoes at me this morning, hang with me, okay? Many attempt to manipulate history for its own agendas and its own purposes. We don't need to do this. We don't need to do this. Unfortunately, young people, our young people, are being taught that because there are some bad things in America's past, that it's a bad nation. That's being taught in schools all across this country. And can I tell you, every nation has bad stuff in their history they like to forget, not just America. The U.S. doesn't stand alone in that when it comes to bad stuff in our nation's history. But I tell you that there's way more good in America's history than bad. For almost 250 years now, we have been a blessing to the entire world in so many ways. So much good, so much innovation, so much progress, so much evil conquered and defeated, thank you to our military, so much security, so much peace brought to you by the good old USA. You know that once you've convinced someone that America was bad back then, it's pretty easy to convince them that America is bad today and therefore in need of radical change. But many of us, I would venture to say in this room, we don't see it that way. We don't see it that way. We love our way of life. We love what America has always stood for. We love what America has always stood against. We love the freedom that we have, and we love our country. Is that okay to love your country? Is it okay? Are Christians allowed to love their country? You know, this has become quite controversial in recent years. Namely now, if you are a Christian and you love your country, this country exclusively actually, you're now being labeled what folks call a Christian nationalist. What does that mean? According to them, whoever them are, a Christian nationalist is being defined as someone who advocates for the fusion of Christianity and American civic life. That don't sound too bad. But in most cases, when someone labels somebody a Christian nationalist, it's meant as a derogatory term toward them. 
when they say that you're a Christian nationalist, what they imply is that you're also a racist, that you don't care about any other nation, that you want Christianity to be forced upon everyone, that you want it to be the official religion of the state. I can tell you, folks, I'm certainly not for taking over the government and forcing people to be Christians. We have thousands of years of history that shows that don't work. That makes things worse. Maybe there are people who are Christians or who say they're Christians and who do these things and who believe these things and who want these things. I just read. But the over, overwhelming majority of us, we don't. We don't. Is it okay to love your country? I say yes. I say it's okay to be a patriot. That patriotism is a good thing. You can be a Christian patriot. You are allowed to love your country. We're going to see here shortly why. We're going to see that, that, that God created nations. And guess what, folks? We've heard this the last few weeks. God's design is good. And it's okay to take pride in your country. You know, it's interesting. We don't care about the Olympics anymore, do we? I remember growing up, boy, I couldn't wait every two years when the Olympics came on. I, I just couldn't wait. And it didn't matter the craziest games, the craziest sports out, out there. I'd watch all of them because I wanted to see if America would win, right? All of us were that way. You know, we had two Olympics in two years, and probably none of us even watched any of it a couple years ago. Last year, how many of you watched the Olympics? Not, not, very, not, not very many of us. You know, there's no allegiance to our country anymore like there once was. Our country has changed so much in the last 50 or 60 years. You know, and why is it all of a sudden okay for Ukrainians to fly their flags and take pride in their country? Even Americans fly Ukrainians' flag and take pride in their country. But in America, we can't do that. We're nationalists. We're Christian nationalists. We're bad. Doesn't make any sense. What's the Bible have to say about this subject? I want to take us back. And I want to look at where God created nations. We find ourselves once again in Genesis this morning. And we're going to be in Genesis chapter 11. But understand this. This is taking place after the flood, right? Humanity apparently had not learned its lessons. If you know anything about what happened, right? God flooded the earth and wiped out the earth and basically said, Noah, we're going to save you and your family and some animals and we're going to hit the reset button here, right? And you would think that humanity would have learned this lesson. And after this flood and the waters receded, God told the sons of Noah, hey, go out, be fruitful, multiply, and scatter. Go out and replenish the earth. But unfortunately, quickly, people began to start settling in one place. And they began to start worshiping themselves. And we see here in this chapter that they do that by attempting to build a city, a big city, believe it or not, which contains a tower that they thought could reach to the heavens. Which in their estimation, if we build this big city and build this big tower, we won't have to scatter. We'll be able to stay here. We'll know where to come back to, right? Let's look at what the word says in Genesis chapter 11, verse 5. So this is going on. It says this in verse 5. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower that the people were building, right? Look, he said, the people are united and they speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. So come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. And in that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. So God says, listen, if you're not going to scatter, I'm going to make you scatter. And it creates different languages, and it forces the people to go out from this one city, this, 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 this Babel, and scatter the earth. Folks, it's clearly God's desire, and it's clearly God's design for us not to live as one nation, but as many nations. A real popular ideal, and it's actually the opposite of nationalism, is this idea of globalism in our world today. What is globalism? Globalism is the coming together of the whole world 
which really doesn't sound like a bad thing on its face, right? That's not a bad thing, globalism. Hey, guess what? We know what's going on in Australia, Japan, China, any part of the world pretty much, anytime we want to. We are connected all over the place. You think it's not, it's not bad to know and bad to be connected to the rest of the world? But can I tell you, folks, God is not okay. He's not for globalism. We'll show you why in a second. Genesis 17, verse 4. Look at what he tells Abraham a few chapters later. This is my covenant with you. I'll make you the father of a multitude of nations. God wants us to live in multiple nations as opposed to one big nation. How do we know that? Well, we know that the Bible forecasts, and by the way, when the Bible makes a forecast, it's a lot more accurate than the weatherman, okay? The Bible forecasts the coming in the end days of an antichrist who will in these last days come to power and he will obtain authority all over the world. And in that, he'll form some sort of globalistic one world government that eventually leads to a one world currency. If you know anything about scripture, the word tells us that he'll force people to take this mark of the beast. And if they don't, they won't be able to use the currency. They won't be able to buy things. They won't be able to eat. I know that's scary, what the Bible says. God clearly sees this coming together as one nation, as one big global thing, as not a good thing. It's not the way he created it. He created nations. And you know, it's interesting to me that of all the nations that, that, that's ever existed, there's not been one nation that's ever had the power and the capacity to take over the whole world like America has, has there? We could have taken over the whole world if we wanted to. We have so many things, so many weapons at our disposal, so much intelligence, so much technology. We led the world in that for so long, probably still do today. We could take over the world if we wanted to, but guess what? We never have. So many others, so many other big empires have tried to do that. Rome failed. Guess what? That was Hitler's goal, right? He was just going to start with Germany, but his goal was to come and take over the planet and make everybody a Nazi. Nations and empires in the Bible, that was their aim, to take over the world. And you know, for all the criticism we get toward our country, from inside and outside, we've never attempted to do that, and I don't think we ever will. That's a good thing. You know, we can logically, too, understand why a global world with no nations and no borders isn't a good thing. We can think about that. I would tell you that in one big global nation, you end up with this melting pot of ideals, and everything becomes watered down. So let's take America, who most of us think is a pretty good place, right? For the most part, we'll get some stuff wrong probably, but, but, but the way we live, our, our ideals of freedom, those things are, are good. And let's take America and now fuse it with North Korea. Mix them together in the name of peace, shared interests. Let's throw in a little China and Russia, which have some major, major control in human rights issues. Then maybe some England, who we think England's pretty good, right? Let, 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 let's mix them all together. What do you get? What you've done now is you've taken American and Western ideals of rights and justice and freedom and prosperity and capitalism, which I believe are all biblical concepts, and mixed them with communism and poverty and governmental control to the extreme and injustice. And how's that going to end up? What have you gained and what have you lost when you do that? Well, you've basically lost all of the good agents and all of the good actors in the world in order for you to compromise with the bad. And my Bible tells me, what fellowship does light have with darkness? You've given those with evil in their hearts and in their plans a voice and a seat at the table and influence. 
Maybe not a good idea. I think the better approach is, is for the good to defeat the bad, which has happened so many times. So they, the good, America and others, can stay good and fight for others and help others. Global Globalism as a one world system gives evil regimes, people, and ultimately the enemy an easier way to accomplish its goals because there's no one to stop it and there's no one to stand against it. In a globalized system, who exactly is it that's stopping Hitler? Probably no one, but thank God somebody did. Thank God men and women not just in our country, in other countries, stopped him. This is why, and it sounds like a political statement, but it's not. It's a biblical one. We must stand for borders and boundaries. We must. Look at what Acts 17, 26 says. Paul says, from one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall. And guess what? He determined their boundaries. It's okay for nations. Matter of fact, it's good for nations to have boundaries and to have borders. You know, there's all kinds of people trying to get into America right now, which is interesting because if we're so bad, why are people trying to come in still? All kinds of people trying to get into America right now from, from our south and Mexico and then from our north and Canada. Our very closest neighbors are trying to come into our country. And for different, diff, different reasons, those coming from Mexico, they, they seek a better life and, and a better future, right? All those coming from Canada, they, they're trying to get away from significant government overreach and loss of individual freedom. If you think about it, if you go, go study some of the laws in Canada right now. Folks, I can tell you, if we were in Canada, some of the things that I preached the last few weeks, I'd be in jail right now. That's a fact. And that's just one country away. You know, and my heart breaks for those people. I, I, I wish that, that they could all come in and we could all uh, help them. But listen, you've got to come in the right way. You have to come across the right way. There are borders. There are laws. And you have to respect those. And so often when people change nations, this is a problem too especially when they don't come in legally. They'll bring their own ideals and, and belief system, the very thing that they were trying to get away from to the new place. The same thing that left the place, that, that, that left their former home undesirable, they'll bring those things here. And that's not a great mix. Borders and boundaries, God understood this. We should understand this. Preserve good and protect from evil. Preserve good and protect from evil. I just believe, maybe you believe like I do, we believe we should steward and we should preserve America. We are blessed to live in this nation. We should be so thankful to live in this nation. Some of you that have been overseas, whether in war or just in other parts of life, you, you understand and you have an idea of how great this and how blessed we are to live in America. We believe that we should try to preserve that. Look at what Matthew 5, 13 says. It's a famous verse. Jesus says this, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? No, it will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Folks, understand this. God doesn't favor one nation over the, another. Okay, we understand that the Jewish people, the Hebrew people were his, were and are his chosen people. But outside of that, he doesn't favor America. He doesn't favor Ukraine. He doesn't favor Russia. He loves all the nations. But we understand this. We must preserve. And when we read this passage, and Jesus talks about this idea of salt. For us with an American understanding, we understand salt as something that's a taste Enhancer, right? It makes things salty. I add salt to my food. It makes it taste better. But when Jesus says this in this book, in Matthew, he is talking about salt as a preservative. In those days, salt would be used to keep things from spoiling. It was a preservative. 
And so when I read that and I think about our country, I, I think that it's my job as a believer, as a Christian, to try to preserve this thing. Even though it's a Christian-ish nation, there are so much, so many things, that, there's so much of a, a, a Christian worldview that has impacted this country. I believe it's our job to try to preserve that for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. As believers, period, we are called to preserve the world. We are literally holding this thing together. We're holding this thing together, God says. We are called to be a force for good until Jesus comes back. Why wouldn't we want to preserve this great nation we live in that's valued? and for the most part been characterized by biblical ideals of freedom and hope and peace and justice. Of course, we should try to protect it and preserve it. And we do that, this is controversial too, by utilizing and trying to gain influence in the public and political arena. Church and politics in America don't mix. Agree with that. We don't want to be about politics. We don't want to be, we don't want to be about endorsing candidates or anything like that. But that doesn't mean that Christians shouldn't be involved in government and shouldn't be involved in the process, in the dialogue. You know, there are popular pastors right now who are telling their churches that believers should lose, that we as believers should lose so non-believers can win. What does that mean? It means this. You know, the best thing would be for churches to stay, stay shut down for like two years during COVID, right? Because when we lose, when we stay shut down, we're protecting those other people and they're winning. So we're taking the loss. We're taking the L so they can win. That we should just sit aside and allow the moral erosion of our society to happen and not make any attempt to turn around things, to influence or to vote, because when we lose, others win. And they would even say this, Jesus lost, right? He came to the earth, he lived and he died, he lost. So all of us could win. That makes sense, right? But folks, I want you to know this. Jesus did not lose. He didn't lose. No way. He's alive today. He's at the right hand of God, the Father. And he's coming back. He didn't lose. He won. He accomplished what he came to accomplish. And he rose again. Folks, if you really believe your Bible and you believe that Jesus really came to give people a full and a satisfying life, like John 10, 10 tells us, you have to believe that doing everything you can to influence the culture toward a Christian world for you is the most loving thing you can do for your neighbor. You get that? Hey, read that again. If you really believe your Bible and believe that Jesus really came to give people a full, a rich, a satisfying life. You have to believe, have to, that doing everything you can to influence the culture toward a Christian worldview is the most loving thing you can do, and it's loving your neighbor. You are loving your neighbor when you fight for Christian concepts and Christian ideals in our government. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that there was a big victory Friday in the overturning of Roe versus Wade in our country. Folks, when we fight against abortion, guess what? We're loving our neighbor. They want us to, they want to make us like we're hating people. We're not hating anybody. We're fighting for life. We're fighting for innocent, unborn lives. I'm, we're even fighting for the lives of the mothers that think right now that that's what they want to do, but later come to regret that and have lots of issues down the road. And we have said so many times that it is not the unpardonable sin. You can't be forgiven from abortion, but let us not forget that there are consequences, mental, emotional consequences, when a woman does that, when we fight against abortion, 
We're fighting for people, not against people. We believe that as Christian patriots, that we can and should hold our nation to its own standards and documents. Paul did that in Acts. We're going to see in just a few minutes. I've got to tell you, folks, there's only one divinely inspired document in the world. And it's not the Constitution of the United States of America. It's not the Declaration of Independence. It's not the Bill of Rights or anything like that. It's the Bible. That's not to say that we don't have much affinity and respect for those documents. They're great, and they're full of wisdom and even biblical concepts. Like, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that, 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 are, that all men are endowed by their what? Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and the Declaration of Independence. Those are biblical ideals, biblical concepts. We have a lot of respect for that, but that is not divinely inspired. The Bible is the only divinely inspired book that's come from God. But we can use these documents for our benefit. I want you to look at what Paul did in Acts chapter 22. Read this with me. We'll be done this morning. So the crowd listened until Paul said that word. And they all began to shout, away with such a fellow. He isn't fit to live as Paul is sharing the gospel to them. They yelled, threw off their coats, and tossed handfuls of dust into the air. The commander brought Paul inside and ordered him lashed with whips to make him confess his crime. His crime was that he was sharing the good news of Jesus with other people, with the world. It says that he wanted to find out why the crowd had become so furious. Paul did. When they tied Paul down and lashed him, Paul said to the officer standing there, is it legal for you to whip a Roman citizen who hasn't even been tried? They don't have rights. When the officer heard this, he went to the commander and asked, what are you doing? This man is a Roman citizen. So the commander went over and asked Paul, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I certainly am, Paul replied. I am too, the commander muttered, and it cost me plenty. And Paul answered, but I am a citizen by birth. The soldiers who were about to interrogate Paul quickly withdrew when they heard he was a Roman citizen. And the commander was frightened because he had ordered him bound and whipped. What did Paul do? Paul took advantage of his Roman citizenship. He said, listen, I know what you're trying to do here, but I have rights because I'm a Roman citizen. You can't just do this to me without a fair trial. Would it have been more godly for Paul to just lay there and take the beating? No. He used his rights as a Roman citizen. Folks, as believers, we can and we should hold our governments to its own standards and its own documents. That's what happened in Roe versus Wade. Christians, believers, Christian attorneys, Christian groups all across the country kept beating this drum that, listen, abortion is not legal if you really interpret the Constitution correctly. If you read our documents, it's not a legal thing. We're pointing back. We're using Scripture. We understand what's right or what's wrong. And we're pointing to those founding documents and saying, listen, it's not right. And eventually, because we did that, and in our, in our holding of our government to its own standards, we won that case. It's okay. To do that, Paul did it. As we close this morning, I want to tell you this one last thing. This is where it may get a little uncomfortable for some of us. There are extreme and there are bad examples of nationalism. Folks, Jesus isn't coming back riding a white horse, waving an American flag, followed by Donald Trump. Sorry, it's not going to happen that way. Our faith is separate. 
from our country. It can be dangerous to intermingle the two too much. For so many of us, our faith in God, there's an ebb and flow in that. There, there's an there, there's a uptick or a downtick based off of who's in office, based off of the news of the day, whether it's good or bad or what we see on TV. And you know what? It shouldn't be that way. We'll talk about here in a few weeks that, that we should have a positive outlook in this world. We shouldn't be angry all the time. You know, that's the danger of constantly looking at, looking at social media and, and watching politics and listening to stuff on the radio and watching 24-hour news. Is Man, eventually you'll get angry. And you're not doing anybody any good when you get to that point. We must understand that while we are in this room, I believe pretty much all of us, we are citizens of America. And we're thankful for that. But we have another citizenship that's more important. This citizenship of America will end. Unless Jesus comes back, we will all die, and, and you will no longer be an American citizen. But there is a citizenship that you can have and will have for all eternity. Look at Philippians 3, verse 20. Paul says this, but our citizenship, you believer, you follower of Christ, you born-again Christian, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. God is first. Our country is second. They're not on an even playing field. God's up here. And guess what? There are lots of other folks around the world that take a lot of pride and believe in their country. And that's okay. There's a lot of differences across the world. And one day, God is going, going to unite the nations on his term. His term, not ours. In a heavenly citizenship. With all the talk today about becoming a citizen of our country, how do you do that? Should certain folks be allowed to be citizens? The most important thing for us this morning is that we make sure that we are people that have the most important citizenship. That we occupy citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. You were born an American citizen. Most of us. Some of us maybe not. Maybe you came here later. Amen. Good stuff. But for the most part, we didn't have to do anything to become an American citizen. But to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, it's going to require something of you. The Bible tells me that we must be born again. In order for you to be a part of this new kingdom, this new citizenship, that's available to you this morning. You must be born again. What's that mean? You've got to lay down everything, all your pride, and come to Jesus. And as you bow your head and close your eyes this morning, understand this. His gates are wide open for you to come in. In this perfect kingdom, he desires that all come and everyone come in. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what your story is. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you haven't done. Today, Jesus Christ invites you in to become a citizen of his kingdom. He wants to give that to you. And very simply, all you have to do is to believe in the fact. And tell him right here where you sit. Believe in the fact that he did come. He lived on this earth. He was a human on this earth. And he died for you. He was a perfect guy. He died for you, for your sins. Took that upon him and died so that you could be in right standing with the Father. He desires to come and make you a new creation, to make you a different person to give you the kind of citizenship, the kind of full life that you want so bad. 
to give you the joy and the peace that, that, that's not going to be found in anywhere else in this world but in him. All you got to do this morning is ask him for it. It's where you said, ask Jesus to come into your life. Jesus, come into my life. Make home in my life. Make me a new creation. Give me a fresh start. Jesus, Jesus, we know that you'll be faithful to do that. For the rest of us in this room, as we wrestle with these difficult issues, we think about our country on this last Sunday in June. God, we tell you right now that we are thankful for the blessing to live in this country. It is a blessing. It's not saying that we're any better than anybody else. We don't say that with arrogance. We just say, God, thank you for the blessing living in this country. Thank you for the freedom that we have, for the ability to stand in front of this room this morning and speak truth like this without risking intense persecution. God, I pray that we as believers, we'd be strong, not in our own strength, but in yours. And we trust you. We trust you. God, you are in control. And no matter what happens in our nation or what doesn't happen in our nation, God, we understand it's going to all work out the way you want it to. And we give it over to you this morning. We trust you. And help us to be the salt that preserves. God, also the light that shines your good news to these people, to this country, to this community. God, we ask all these things in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen.